and welcome to Kent Tonight, live on KMTV. I'm Andy Richards. Your top stories on Wednesday, the 22nd of November. Man found dead near Maidstone. Three arrested after body found in a flat in Barming. I mean, from London, yeah, you expect it. I lived in London all my life. From down here, it's been quite calm. Kent spiralling drug crisis. South Annet MP Craig McKinney says Westminster has to act. Physical and mental health issues, disruption of families, effects on children and their life chances. Marching for breastfeeding. Protesters take to the streets against cuts in services. We need lactation -led, consultant led care and we need it on a walk in basis when we need it. And in sport, I'll be looking back on a disappointing evening for our Kent sides in the National League. But first this evening, some breaking news for you. We've learned that a man involved in a shooting in Folkestone has died this afternoon. The incident happened at the Red Cow pub in Ford Street. Our reporter, Louisa Britton, has been following the story and joins me now. So what's the very latest, Louisa? The latest we know is the man who was involved in the shooting um, earlier on today has unfortunately died at the scene. Police were called to the Red Cow pub in Folkestone in Ford Street at around 11.30 this morning. They were called there. Witnesses um, said that they saw a huge emergency presence. Um, they reported seeing 10 to 12 vehicles parked outside the pub, so really a huge response to the incident. Um, police then said that a man had been seriously injured after um, after they reported they they found gunshot wounds, but um, unfortunately he died at the scene. Um, the pub itself is sort of reported to be a heart of community, somewhere where everyone knows everyone. It's actually the second oldest pub in Folkestone. And what do we know about the victim? So the the man's been named locally as 58-year-old landlord um, Joe Daniels. Um, his next of kin have been informed. Police have told them of the incident, um, and their neighbours that his neighbours have said that he was lovely person and that he had a larger than life character so quite an unfortunate event. And has there been much from the police yet? Police haven't released a huge amount of information regarding the incident. Um, what they have said is that they've recovered a firearm at the property, so I think possibly the firearm that was involved in the incident. Um, they've also said that um, they're in in continuing their investigations as to the circumstances of the incident. They haven't really released any more information. I called them up about 10, 15 minutes ago, asking them um, if they had any more information about how they were treating the incident, and they said that the latest they could say was that they were still investigating it. No one's been arrested, um, but they are appealing for further witnesses, people to come forward if they were there, if they might have seen something, or if they had any more information that might be able to bring forward. Louisa, thank you very much indeed, and we'll have more on that when we get it. Now, two men and a woman have been arrested after a man was found dead in a flat near Maidstone. The man was discovered last night at the flats in Wolford Road near Barming. Harry Pete has been to the scene today. Police, forensic vans and ambulances were still at the block of flats at Woodford Road this morning after it was revealed that a man was found dead in a flat. The incident took place around half ten last night, with neighbours reporting that they'd heard noise coming from the top floor apartment. Didn't see anything, no. We just heard that there was a, a, some sort of commotion and um, that's all I know. I mean, the neighbours told me that, a friend of mine. Because I live in the block, they've let me in, but they're not letting anyone in the block, so they're obviously investigating still and uh, more's to come, so we'll hear about it along the line. Police were called last night by paramedics who were already at the scene. This morning, a Kent Police spokesperson said that officers are awaiting the findings of a post-mortem and three people, two men and a woman from Maidstone, have been arrested in connection with the death. Officers were also spotted carrying out evidence bags from the flats. Meanwhile, the three people arrested are still in custody as police look into the death. Speaking to residents today, some have said that in recent months, issues in the area have got worse. But on the whole, they've said that this is normally a peaceful and quiet neighbourhood and that today's events come as a big shock. It's very quiet, very, very quiet. I know this part of my stone is, I mean, it can get rowdy and loud. If you go down the uh, other side of it, it can be. I was having cock safe, there was always something happening, but down this end, it's been up, uh, not at a peak. Everyone's asleep, bed by 10 o'clock, because they're elderly, like you said. You know, if I've ever been selling on a bit, lad, they've let me know. So I know how, this, uh, how it works in, that, in my block. I thought it was a nice area, and it, just, it changes your perspective. I mean, Maidstone is a nice area. So you don't, I mean, from London, yeah, you expect it. I lived in London all my life. From down here, it's been quite calm. There's been no trouble around here since I've been living here at all, in any of the blocks. I've never seen a police presence. The cause of the man's death is still unknown, but more details are expected in the coming weeks. Harry Pete for KMTV in Barming.
An 18-year-old man's been sent to prison after swinging a wooden plank at two women in a homophobic attack in Margate. Tyler Crane shouted abuse at the couple before swinging a plank covered with nails at them and dragging one of them along the ground by her hair. It happened in Grosvenor Hill. He was sentenced to a year and a half in a young offenders institution. Next tonight, the Chancellor's delivered his second budget this afternoon. From more Brexit preparations to freezing duty on wine and beer, Philip Hammond put forward his plans to a packed House of Commons. Well, to talk about some of the highlights of the budget, I'm joined by Professor Tim Luckhurst, head of the Centre of Journalism at the University of Kent. So, so Tim, first of all, what was the main message from this budget? Well, I'm sure that Philip Hammond would tell you that the main message was that this is a government which isn't just concentrating on Brexit, it's concentrating on domestic policy too. In fact, I think the message that came across is that Brexit is the biggest single concern this government has got, and it knows it. Mr Hammond has announced £3 billion to prepare for any potential outcome of Brexit. That's up from £700 million before, so a colossal increase. A lot of Critics will say he should be spending that money on domestic policy. In fact, he's spending it on Brexit because he doesn't know what the outcome of the Brexit negotiations are going to be, and he does know that Britain has to, pre to prepare for any possible outcome, and that includes a no-deal outcome. So I think the Brexit message from this is very powerful indeed. Because there's very little room for manoeuvre now, really, with Brexit at all, in terms of financing it, so he's really got to get it right soon. He's got to get it right soon. He's got to make preparations in departments of state across the whole of government, and he's got to do it essentially by March 2019. So there is a huge amount of work to be done, and Mr Hammond's recognising the need to do that urgently. And turning to the domestic policies, what are some of the highlights there? I think the biggest single one is Mr Hammond's commitment to housing. He's promising £44 billion of government investment to get towards his target of 300,000 new homes being built in Britain by 2020. But in the short term, he's also abolished stamp duty for first-time buyers on properties up to £300,000. A huge incentive for young people trying to buy their first home. There will be no stamp duty applicable on those purchases. It's a real commitment to boosting the housing market. So first-time buyers, also a little, little bit in there as well about the, the extending the rail ticket as well for, for yes, young people. Are they going after younger people to try and it, combat that problem the Tories have already ha always it, had? You're not for a moment suggesting that they might be trying to contest the young vote with the Labour Party, are you? Yes, of course they are, Andy. You're absolutely right. So yes, there is a new rail card for the 26 to 30-year-olds who will be able to get a third off their rail travel. That's a n nice incentive for the not quite student age, but still young voters who have been leaning towards Mr Corbyn's Labour Party. The Conservatives are clearly trying to fight for those votes. And were there any um, obvious um, things missing from today's budget? No, but there were things which were clearly designed again for a political reason to contest the Labour Party's claim on the electorate at the moment. And amongst those, there's an emergency package of funding to improve the universal credit scheme. So the widely criticised new universal credit scheme is going to get a large investment of cash to shorten the time that people wait before they get to their first payment and to give them cash advantages, advances Sorry, if they're in desperate need. That's a big step forward. There's also an attempt to grab the new technology vote to say that Britain's open for business by saying that we will legislate to allow driverless cars on our roads by 2021. It's essentially a big stein saying Britain's open for investment. If you want to innovate, if you want to build new technology, come here. We won't regulate you out of business. So that's a big one and it'll probably go down well with the high-tech industry. Tim, thank you very much indeed. Meanwhile, South Thanet MP Craig McKinley's led a parliamentary debate on the human and financial costs of drug addiction. Cameron Tucker has this report. This is an Mr McKinley and other MPs laid out their concerns about the dangers of costs posed by drug use in a 90-minute debate held in Westminster Hall. The human costs are fairly obvious. I, I think we would all have our own um, points to add to my list, but they would be physical and mental health issues disruption of families, the effects on children and their life chances, and the increasingly clear link between drug use during pregnancy and various autism spectrum conditions and physical d deformity in children. The South Thanet MP has been vocal about drug use since taking office in 2015 and is currently the chairman of the all-party parliamentary group on the harmful effects of cannabis. The debate comes at a time when drug use and misuse in the county is under the spotlight. 
Figures released last month showed there were 259 drug-related deaths in Kent between 2014 and 2016, a record high. And while this may be a simulated car accident, there were 59 incidents on Kent's roads last year as a result of drugs, three causing deaths. The importance of rehabilitation was discussed in today's debate, something the Kenwood Trust has been tasked with for four decades. But recent years have seen them facing challenges in terms of funding and resources. Certain services have really sort of disappeared off the scene and that's quite noticeable now. So a lot of the drug and alcohol services that were around have disappeared now, so it's making its mark now and then you can tell these further figures because what's out there is not fitting everyone's criteria for their recovery. The debate concluded with calls for re-evaluating sentencing guidelines for drug supply and a renewed focus on drug education at schools. Cameron Tucker for KMTV. Now, coming up after the break, we'll find out why breastfeeding campaigners were protesting in Maidstone earlier today. Make sure you don't go away. So basically they're removing open access to lactation consultants um, and uh, they're making a whole swathe of other changes, so reducing the amount of breastfeeding groups from 17 a week to four. Um, mums won't be able to go and get the specialist support that they can currently and that's what we're really concerned about. Welcome back to Kent Tonight, live on KMTV. Now, three people have been arrested after a man was found dead in a block of flats near Maidstone. Police and forensic teams were still at the scene in Barming today after the body was discovered late last night by paramedics. Harry Pete has more. This morning, a Kent police spokesperson said that officers are awaiting the findings of a post-mortem and three people, two men and a woman from Maidstone, have been arrested in connection with the death. Officers were also spotted carrying out evidence bags from the flats. Meanwhile, the three people arrested are still in custody as police look into the death. Speaking to residents today, some have said that in recent months, issues in the area have got worse. But on the whole, they've said that this is normally a peaceful and quiet neighbourhood and that today's events come as a big shock. It's very quiet, very, very quiet. I know this part of my stone is, I mean, it can get rowdy and loud. If you go down the uh, other side of it, it can be. I was having cock safe, there was always something happening, but down this end, it's been up, uh, not at a peak. Everyone's asleep, bed by 10 o'clock, because they're elderly, like you said. You know, if I've had me selling on a bit, lad, they've let me know. So I know how, this, uh, how it works in, that, in my block. I thought it was a nice area, and that it changes your perspective. Now, Kent County Council says it will be short of £149 million to meet the growing demand for school places over the next four years. Education chiefs say they could be facing a funding crisis as the counties come under increasing pressure for school places. Councillor Roger Goff, KCC's Cabinet Member for Education, told us there's been a bulge in numbers at primary schools who are now coming into secondary schools. We believe over the next few years we will need what we call 84 forms of entry. So that's 84 extra classes going all the way through secondary school. That's the equivalent of a more than a dozen uh, new typically sized secondary schools. It won't all necessarily be in that form. It may be additions to and expansions of existing schools in some cases. But that gives you an idea of the scale of it. With a look back on how Kent sides fared in last night's football, here's Keelan with the sport. We'll start with another good result for Gillingham under the stewardship of Steve Lovell. A last gasp equaliser from Tom Eves ensured the Jills came back from Blackpool with a point following a one-all draw. Eves scored just before stoppage time to level up and then almost found a winner minutes later. Kyle Vassell had earlier given the host the lead at Bloomfield Road, but Eves' seventh goal of the campaign means Gillingham stayed 20th, a point clear of the relegation places. In the National League, it was an evening to forget for our Kent sides. Chris Kinnear's Dover were knocked off top spot after they lost 1-0 at Dagenham and Redbridge. Morgan Ferrier struck the only goal of the game for the Essex outfit. And Wrexham, fresh from defeating Ebbsfleet on Saturday, went top after they beat Solihull Moors 1-0. Next up for the Whites is a game at home to AFC Fylde on Saturday. 
At the Gallagher Stadium, Maidstone United struggles at home continued. Jay Saunders' side were thrashed 4-0 by Boreham Wood, following a disappointing one-all draw against bottom side Solihull Moors on Saturday, with Delano, Sam York and Jai Reason both suspended, and Tom Raitt, Ollie Muldoon and Josh Hare injured. Saunders' squad was down to the bare bones. A double from Daryl Holman pioneered Boreham's comfortable win as Maidstone dropped to seventh in the National League. It wasn't any better for Ebbsfleet, whose W double header ended in double defeat. A 1 0 reverse to Woking last night followed a 2 0 loss at Wrexham on Saturday. Daryl McMahon admitted they weren't at their normal levels yesterday, as Alfred Effiong's first half strike was enough to give Woking the points. The result means Fleet dropped to 15th in the table. In the National League South, Dartford remained top but had to settle for a point at home to Weldston. The darts came from 2-1 down to lead 3-2, courtesy of Alfie Pavey and Andy Pugh goals. But a late penalty from Dan Green meant the game finished 3-3. In the Bostick Premier, there were wins for Tunbridge Angels and Margate, with both sides now in the top ten. Whilst in the Bostick South, Hythe and Sittingbourne are sixth and seventh respectively. Hythe drew 0-0 with Greenwich Borough, while Sittingbourne defeated Molsey 3-2. I'll be back with more later on in the programme, including highlights of Gillingham's one all draw with Blackpool. I'll see you then. Now, worried mums, dads and children took, this, took to the streets of Maidstone today to voice their concerns about changes to breastfeeding services. Campaign group Keep Kent Breastfeeding presented a petition to the council asking them to rethink cuts in specialist provisions. Poppy Jeffrey went along to find out more. More than 60 people gathered to present a petition to Kent County Council asking them not to make a money-saving move affecting breastfeeding services. KCC wants to bring in trained midwives and nurses from the health visiting service to support new mothers rather than specialist breastfeeding support. It would start in March and save them £400,000 each year. Keep Kent Breastfeeding organised a peaceful demo, with many people bringing their children along as they made their way from Maystone West Station to County Hall to give over the 5,000 strong petition. Um, breastfeeding mums quite often need help, they need specialist help. There are more health sisters on the ground now than there were, but they are not trained to the same extent. They can't offer the quality, quality care we get from our lactation consultants. We need lactation -le consultant-led care and we need it on a walk-in basis when we need it. We know what, what we need, we're the mums, we know they need to listen to us. They do, I believe, want, want us to have a good service, a responsive service, but I do think there are slight problems with them understanding some of our points and so I think we need to be really, we need to keep dialogue open, we need to really work really hard as a, as a pressure group, we need, to, we need to work really hard with KCC to make a really good plan for Kent. We want to be world leaders, countrywide leaders, we want our, our services to be the best in the UK. If it goes ahead, the move will see 17 specialist clinics and 21 breastfeeding peer support clinics replaced with 36 general clinics and four specialist clinics spread across the county. They're removing open access to lactation consultants um, and uh, they're making a whole swathes of other changes, so reducing the amount of breastfeeding groups. Mums won't be able to go and get the specialist support that they can currently and that's what we're really concerned about. But council leader Paul Carter said he wants to make sure the services are not made worse by the changes. I'm determined to make sure that the service is improved, not diminished, and I believe we have the opportunity and the capability to do exactly that. I believe strongly, as I say, as hard the uh, capacity of uh, uh, the extra 10 million invest in doubling the number of health visitors in the county of Kent can deliver uh, a better service uh, than the service that went before and we are on a mission to prove uh, exactly that but we need the help of mothers uh, to be a critical friend. But it's now a waiting game to see if the protest will affect the council's decision. The current consultation ends on December the 3rd. This is Poppy Jeffrey for KMTV in Maidstone. Now, a volunteer in Maidstone has been awarded an MBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours. Chris Barnby has been volunteering at Young Lives Foundation for 12 years, supporting vulnerable people in police custody. Records show he's helped people in more than 1,700 interviews. I'm very pleased to say Chris joins me on the sofa now. So, Chris, you picked up your MBE yesterday. First of all, what was that experience like? Uh, it was amazing. Uh, my wife and two daughters came with me. 
Uh, we had to be there early in the morning, and it was an amazing experience. It's Prince William. We didn't know beforehand where it's going to be uh, the Queen or Prince William, uh, but it's Prince William, and it is fantastic. And what did he say to you? Uh, he, well, I, I expect him to talk about uh, my citation was a service to policing and the community. Uh, but he obviously knew everything about the appropriate adult work. He's asking about the appropriate adults, the age group. So he'd done a lot of research. Uh, he knew that I'd been on the Royal Yacht Britannia, so he's talking about that. So I was expecting him to talk about uh, the policing, but no, it's everything else. And what about the volunteering work itself? 1,700 interviews. Mm. What made you volunteer in such you know, high-pressured kind of... Well, I, I was on the independent monitoring board of one of the uh, Sheppey prisons, and one of my colleagues there was an appropriate adult, and she was telling me about the role, and I, I came interested that way, and I contacted uh, what was then the Kent Appropriate Adult Service, but now changed to Young Lives Foundation, and uh, I became an appropriate adult. But because I lived in Tunbridge and I had my own book business there, uh, I just worked in Tunbridge custody, whereas my colleagues work throughout the county. And what's made you continue all these years and do all these interviews? Uh, I enjoyed working with the youngsters. It's, it's very easy to judge uh, these youngsters and vulnerable adults who see things in the papers. But uh, no, I, I had an empathy with them and I enjoyed working. I wasn't there to judge them. I was there to support them during the police interviews. Uh, and to facilitate with communication, which is the main thing, in case they uh, didn't really understand the questioning, what was going on. And the organisation you, you volunteer for, it must be so crucial to these young people. Yeah, the Young Lives Foundation, they, they look after the proper adults throughout the country, and it's, they do a fantastic job, every one of them. Uh, and they're there, you know, they, they don't only do the, the proper adults, they mentor in other ways. Uh, but no, the, the youngsters, uh, you're there for them. And it's one of these things, you know, that for every viewer of yours who ch whose child or family member is arrested, it's important they realise that there's someone in the police station who isn't part of the police, who is there looking after their interests and supporting them. Well, thank you ever so much for coming in and congratulations again. Now, a reminder, you can stay up to date with all the new sport and weather from right across Kent, whenever and wherever you are, by clicking on kmtv.co.uk. You'll find breaking news, local features, repeats of our special programmes, plus the latest travel news. So it's looking pretty wet and windy across the county this evening. It looks completely different tomorrow morning, though, with sunny spells and temperatures will drop to 10 or 11, still feeling mild. The sunshine continues into the afternoon with clear skies across Kent. Looking at the rest of the week and Friday's looking overcast before it clears up towards the weekend. Coming up after the break, we ask phone users whether Google tracking their location is an invasion of their privacy. Don't go away. And welcome to Kent Tonight, live on KMTV. I'm Andy Richards. Your top stories on Wednesday, the 22nd of November. Man found dead near Maidstone. Three arrested after body found in a flat in Barming. From London, yeah, you expect it. I lived in London all my life. From down here, it's been quite calm. Kent spiralling drug crisis. South Annet MP Craig McKinney says Westminster has to act. Physical, mental health issues, disruption of families, effects on children and their life chances. Marching for breastfeeding, protesters take to the streets against cuts in services. We need lactation -led, consultant led care and we need it on a walk-in basis when we need it. And in sport I'll bring you highlights of Gillingham's one-all draw away at Blackpool. Our top story this evening, two men and a woman have been arrested after a man was found dead in a flat near Maidstone. The man was discovered last night at the flats in Wolford Road near Barming. Harry Pete was at the scene today. 
Police, forensic vans and ambulances were still at the block of flats at Woodford Road this morning after it was revealed that a man was found dead in a flat. The incident took place around half ten last night with neighbours reporting that they'd heard noise coming from the top floor apartment. Didn't see anything, no. We just heard that there was a, a, some sort of commotion and um, that's all I know. I mean, the neighbours told me that, a friend of mine. Because I live in the block, they've let me in, but they're not letting anyone in the block, so they're obviously investigating still and uh, more's to come, so we'll hear about it along the line. Police were called last night by paramedics who were already at the scene. This morning, a Kent Police spokesperson said that officers are awaiting the findings of a post-mortem and three people, two men and a woman from Maidstone, have been arrested in connection with the death. Officers were also spotted carrying out evidence bags from the flats. Meanwhile, the three people arrested are still in custody as police look into the death. Speaking to residents today, some have said that in recent months, issues in the area have got worse. But on the whole, they've said that this is normally a peaceful and quiet neighbourhood and that today's events come as a big shock. It's very quiet, very, very quiet. I know this part of my stone is, I mean, it can get rowdy and loud. If you go down the uh, other side of it, it can be. I was having cock safe, there was always something happening. But down this end, it's been up, uh, not at a peak. Everyone's asleep bed by 10 o'clock because they're elderly, like you said. You know, if I've ever been selling on a bit, they'd have let me know. So I know how, this, uh, how it works in, that, in my block. I thought it was a nice area. I know it's, it changes your perspective. I mean, Maidstone is a nice area. So you don't, I mean, from London, yeah, you expect it. I lived in London all my life. From down here, it's been quite calm. There's been no trouble around here since I've been living here at all, in any of the blocks. I've never seen a police presence. The cause of the man's death is still unknown, but more details are expected in the coming weeks. Harry Pete for Kane TV in Barming. A man's been taken to hospital after a fire at a flat in Balmora Road in Gillingham. Kent Fire and Rescue Service were called to the three-storey building at around 10 o'clock last night and left shortly before midnight. There are no other reports of any injuries and the cause of the fire is now being investigated. Now, life-saving innovations are being held up in the NHS because some doctors think it's dirty to work um, and prefer the private sector. That's according to the government's chief medical officer, Dame Sally Davies. She said staff were reluctant to work with the profitable private sector, even if it meant they wouldn't get a chance to improve their skills. So joining me now on the sofa to talk a bit more about this is Strew GP, Dr Julian Spinks. So, Julian, yeah. what do you make of the, the comments there? Um, We've always had a, a mixed provision uh, between the NHS and private sector. Um, but we're actually seeing the private sector expanding. And how we move doctors between the two is actually becoming a problem. Um, because at the moment, there's, there's a tendency um, to either go for one or the other. But we need them to work in both, particularly if they have skills in research and so on, to get the most out of it. And have you ever been in this situation that the, the chief medical officer is saying? Uh, no, because really in general practice we haven't had the same opportunity to do private medicine. In fact, the contracts I work with uh, mean that I can't offer private services to my own patients other than in restricted uh, circumstances. Although one has to say that particularly when you're looking at some of the new app-based uh, services, there's an increase in the number of uh, uh, GP services that are actually private-based. And let's talk a little bit about today's budget, obviously. So what have you made of some of the, the comments from Philip Hammond? So he said, in his words, the NHS is under pressure right now. What would you say to that statement? Tell me about it, absolutely. I mean, I, I think my, my feelings about the, the budget is that I was disappointed. I was underwhelmed. Um, it, it's strange to think that £2.8 billion doesn't sound like enough, but it isn't. If you look at things like the King's Fund, they've suggested the next year we need £4 billion, and yet that 2.8 is actually over two and a half years. And for uh, this winter, we're getting £350 million. It's a drop in the ocean and has probably already been spent by hospitals on locums. So, you know, it isn't as big as it looks, and we are going to struggle. Um, the Chief Medical Officer has said, oh, well, actually, we may have to uh, restrict services. People will have to wait longer and so on. Do you, so what would have you liked to have seen? How much do you think should have been put aside? Uh, we've got to save 20 billion uh, over the next couple of years and we can't make that sort of saving. Um, I think the 4 billion over the next 12 months would have been reasonable to actually make sure we can maintain a quality of service. Um, it sounds like a lot, but uh, it reflects the fact that we've had dropping finances in the NHS. Next year, without extra money, we'd have less per patient per year than we've had previously. Um, and so we do need that extra injection because it's very, very hungry for money and also it needs staff to actually make the NHS work.
And something we have covered this week as well that I'll quickly ask you about, and I don't you know about it, but uh, there's been campaigners going up to speak to, to Jeremy Hunt about the, the state of, of healthcare in East Kent. Um, yes. Do you think those kind of calls will be answered? Do you think that it does need people from, uh, from the public to step forward and talk about their healthcare? Or do you think it's down to health professionals like yourself to, to do the campaigning? I think health professionals, the BMA, have to do it as well. But politicians do tend to respond to the general public because they tend to dismiss professionals as having self-interest. So, yes, I think it's good that we get the public involved because certainly in East Kent we're in a real problem, particularly the Folkestone area. If we don't get more GPs, uh, I don't know how they're going to carry on providing a good service. Dr Spinks, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Now, next, the location data from Android smartphone users has been collected by Google, even when location services are switched off or even if SIM cards have been removed. An investigation found Google's been using nearby mobile masks to gather information on Android users since the start of, the start of the year. Google said the data was never stored and would update the Android system to stop the practice. But is this an invasion of privacy? We asked shoppers in Gillingham. Definitely. If, if people can see where you are, if you've got trouble with anyone, or if you, it, 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 anyone can find you, it's a bit, it's a bit weird, really. It's not really good, I don't think. Definitely. It's just, again, it, it feels like you're being stalked wherever you go. You have no prizes yourself. You know, you could go on holiday and they'll know exactly where you are. It's just, yeah, it's a bit too much. To me personally, I think it's a good idea. Um, purely that. Obviously, they know where you are, and obviously, if, if you're in any any difficulty anywhere, you know that you know someone that knows that your phone would normally be on. If you've switched it off for some reason, they would then perhaps trace it back that way. I suppose it is, but it doesn't bother me because I'm not doing anything wrong. I think that would only be pertinent if you were doing something wrong. I'm not, so I don't really care. <laughs> yes, definitely. Why? Anything that isn't done with my say so is an invasion of my privacy. No I don't because it, it, it isn't on all the time I think uh, and it doesn't really bother me. Oh I know the word know everything about you and I just had enough. I don't have any private life anymore and I don't like it. Shoppers in Gillingham there, but what do you think? Is this an invasion of your privacy? Join the debate by using the hashtag Kent says. Now, don't forget that you can keep up to date on all things going on in Kent by visiting our website, kntv.co.uk. You can check out some of our latest stories from across the county, like this video from last week about a Marden distillery looking to be part of the gin revolution. Mother's Ruin has become Marden's maker, but the drinks industry was not the first career path for the award-winning masterminds behind Anno Distillers. We uh, moved from drugs onto drink, all perfectly legal. Um, Norman and I are lifelong organic chemists. We worked in, our, in the pharmaceutical industry for all of our lives. Um, we had a, a change of direction in 2010. We took early retirement and moved into setting up Anno. Using our scientific backgrounds has helped enormously in developing our products and understanding how the distillation process uh, produ produces the types of flavours that we want in our products. And uh, we're always surprised by how much science there is behind what we are producing. And this is where the magic happens, a 300 litre copper pot still christened Patients, where all the ingredients for the gin are loaded overnight at 60 degrees centigrade before being distilled the following morning. The craft distillers are part of a gin revolution sweeping across county and country. Back in June, tax revenues from spirit sales overtook beer for the first time, primarily thanks to record gin sales. Duties rose by 7% to almost £3.4 billion for the last tax year, compared to a nearer £3.3 billion for beer. More diverse flavours, a relaxing on small distillery production by HMRC and customers willing to pay for more expensive gins have all led to the spirits resurgence. But after years of being stuck on the shelf, could this be just a fad? No, I don't think it's a fad. I mean, gin is a long-lasting spirit. It's been going hundreds of years. There's a lot of interest lately in the last few years. Somewhere around one 
billion pounds going up to 1.3 billion in 2020 so sales are continue to accelerate I think it's a little bit more than a fad uh, with new products coming out new designs of products coming out there's there's still a thirst for something new uh, we can we can now start to see gin pairings with food so that's extending the the use of the uh, the, the product um, line so I think it will continue well beyond 2020. Anno have already raised a third of their target from their crowdfunding campaign to expand the business and be a bigger player in an industry that's currently in high spirits. Cameron Tucker, KMTV, Marden. Still to come, Key, then we'll have the highlights from Bloomfield Road where Gillingham picked up another point on their travels at Blackpool. Welcome back to Kent tonight, live on KMTV on Wednesday, the 22nd of November. In case you missed it, body found embalming. Three arrested after a man's found dead in a flat near Maidstone. Because I live in the block, they've let me in, but they're not letting anyone in the block, so they're obviously investigating still, and uh, more's to come. The government has to act now. South Thanet MP Craig McKinley says Kent has a drug abuse crisis. The increasingly clear link between drug use during pregnancy and various autism spectrum conditions and physical deformity in children. Save Our Service campaign group urged Kent County Council to rethink about cuts in breastfeeding specialists. We want to be world leaders, countrywide leaders. We want our, our services to be the best in the UK. And in sport, a negative night for our National League sides, but a positive one for the Jills as their impressive away form continues. Time now for your pick of the papers with a look at what's making the news in print, online and radio across Kent. Earlier today, I caught up with KMTV's Lyndon Lomax, who started off by telling me about a Winston Churchill painting, which sold for more than £300,000. First story I'd like to talk about is the goldfish pool at Chartwell, which is the name of this painting here. It's an abstract painting. Uh, painted by one Sir Winston Churchill. It was actually the last painting he did just before his death a few years later and it was painted here in uh, Chartwell by Sevenoaks at his house. It recently sold this week for £357,000. Um, it's described as a unique and moving insight into his final years and it was given to his bodyguard who was with him for 15 years uh, from 1950 to 65. So it came up for sale at Sotheby's recently and they put a guide price on it between 50 and £80,000. It actually went for 290000 but when you factor in the, the fees and the taxes, etc., it was a whopping £357,000. Um, it's, you know, art is very uh, different to different people, but uh, it isn't the first time that one of uh, Sir Winston's paintings have gone on sale and gone for far more than they thought. In 19... Uh, Sorry, in 1932, a painting that he did from then went for sale a few years ago, went for 1.8 million, which was four times the guide price. Um, whilst looking into this uh, particular piece, a few features, uh, a few facts came up. He had more words published than William Shakespeare. He painted more than 500 works of art and he never sold one. He gave them away uh, as gifts to friends and family. So just a nice little story there. Fascinating stuff, Lyndon. And your second story? Well, from something that's been sold to something that's coming up to, to be sold, uh, a Martello Tower over at Dimchurch in, in Romney Marsh. It's a 19th century structure. It's got a guide price of 70 to £75,000. Don't worry about parking, because you can hopefully see from this photo, it's actually in the middle of a car park. Um, these were built, as I said, in the 19th century to protect the British Empire from, from uh, invasions from across the water. So this will go for sale in early December with Clive Empson, and uh, it's an interesting if you uh, want to look at a round house to buy. But yeah, but what will you do with it for £70,000? I'm not really sure, but I think the first thing I would do is give it a lick of paint. <laughs> And your third story, Lyndon? Well, flush with success, as it says here. This is 
all about a Sheppy pub um, that's just been awarded a Lou of the Year awards. Now the Lou of the Year awards are in their 30th year, so it's it's quite taken very seriously. And the Bell and Lion in Sheerness uh, High Street has been a platinum star awarded. Uh, Kelly Smith, who runs the Weatherspoons pub, is uh, immensely proud and said that the staff always ensure that everything is clean. Up here you can see the duty manager, Amy Glazier. Um, they've just recently spent 1.2 million on refurbing the former Britain and Hobbs electrical store and obviously it's gone down really well. Uh, they're exceptional facilities and uh, it's well worth going in there to spend a penny. Lyndon, I'm impressed you didn't do too many toilet jokes. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Reminder, you can stay up to date with all the news, sport and weather from right across Kent whenever and wherever you are by clicking on kmtv.co.uk. You'll find breaking news, local features, repeats of our special programmes plus the latest travel news. It was another impressive away result for Gilliam last night. With more, here's Keelan with the sport. So, Keelan, what do you think the Jills will think of last night's result against the uh, Tangerines? A good one? Yeah, I think so. In the end, it was a, it was a bit like uh, the game of the weekend where they scored late on to get a one all draw against Berry, and uh, they scored late on last night to grind out a gritty 1 0 win. And uh, Tommy's with a, with a head at deep into stoppage time, or just before stoppage time, making it one apiece. So, uh, a really good result overall. We can see the best of the action here, and uh, a great opportunity for Gillingham to continue their fantastic form away from home because it was three on the bounce going into this one. And Josh Parker, who's been in fantastic form all most get grabbing the opening go after good work from Lee Martin on the left hand side first real chance uh, for Blackpool they dominated the first half Thomas Holy making his first stop of the game there but then eventually it did take the lead four minutes before the break Carl Vassell he's their top scorer this season initially charged down well by Gabriel Zakawani but the second one does beat Holy and that was Blackpool's lead 1-0 at the break Gillingham came back into it they had to open themselves up to try and get back in the game second half Connor Wilkinson scored against Walsall at the weekend probably should have scored there poor finish and it remained 1-0 at that stage as it did when Josh Parker's effort was blocked uh, inside the final few minutes. But so the ball was then recycled out to Luke O'Neill, puts the cross into the back post, and there is Tom Eaves, seventh league goal of the season, eight in all competitions for him, and that was a goal just before uh, stoppage time. And then the same combination almost won it for Gillingham uh, deep into stoppage time. That header turned away, but uh, in the end it finished one apiece. Uh, so a, a decent result overall for um, for Gillingham, and uh, I think Tom Eaves at the moment he's really proving to be a top top striker. And eight goals in all competitions, he's got seven in fourteen in the league. It's been a great return from the big man. Uh, to snooker now, and Ditton's Barry Hawkins continues to struggle with his form after he was knocked out of the Northern Ireland Open. The Hawk lost 4-3 to Chinese prospect Zhao Zintong. The turning point of the contest proved to be the fifth frame, which was won by the 20-year-old as he potted a fluke on the blue to go 3-2 up. The result comes a day after Raynham's Gerard Green pushed world number 23 Joe Perry all the way before eventually losing by the same scoreline 4-3. That's in it for Sport 4 today. I'll be back with more for you tomorrow. It's looking rather rough tonight with rain and strong winds across Kent. Tomorrow morning will bring sunny spells and temperatures of 10 or 11 degrees into the afternoon and there'll be blue skies and sunshine for the county. Looking to Friday and the weekend, it'll be overcast before it turns sunnier and colder on Saturday and Sunday. Coming up after the break is our business show, Chris & Co. I'll be speaking to Chris Price about what to expect in this latest episode in a minute. But first, here's Josie Hannett with a roundup of what's making the headlines for businesses in the county. Council chiefs are urging the government to back a £300 million bid to help pay for schools, roads and other facilities needed when a huge development in East Kent gets underway. 12,000 homes are being built in the Otterpool Garden town. The site is seven miles from Folkestone and is accessible from Junction 11 of the M20 and Western Hangar train station. KCC and Shepway District Council have teamed up to submit a bid for a share of government funds to help boost the number of new homes being built. 
Part of the main runway of the former Manston Airport will be reopened for heritage aviation under the latest plans put forward by the site's owners. The proposals, which went on show to the public for the first time earlier this week, included a new home for two museums. The £500 million plans for Stonehill Park, as it's now described by its owners, will also include at least 2,500 homes with an ultimate capacity for around 4,000. And Vintage Margate theme park Dreamland is officially out of administration and is promising to bring new rides for next year. Sands Heritage Limited, the park's owner, began trading as normal again at the start of the month following a corporate reorganisation. It comes after a £25 million investment earlier this year, which allowed bosses to re-landscape the park in Margate and restore more of its vintage rides. Dreamland bosses also say they're committed to delivering even more events in 2018. So Chris joins me now. Chris, been a huge day for businesses and politicians, of course. The budget, what have you made of it today? Well, it's actually um, peculiarly been a budget that has had a big rabbit out of the hat with this stamp duty announcement of £300,000. Um, uh, no, no, no stamp duty on, on property purchases of up to £300,000. But for businesses, there's actually not really been a great deal in there. Um, I mean, there's been some slight changes to... Um, uh, business rates, so so the VAT, um, eighty-five thousand pounds for the next two years, and um, there's also going to be there's also been some um, discussion about business rate revaluations. They're going to happen every three years rather than five years. But really, there was very little for businesses to sink their teeth into. Um, this has actually been very much a, a budget, it seems, where the chancellor has tried to um, put out some policies that are going to catch the eye, um, but perhaps putting some money aside for a rainy day. What with Brexit coming up. Because the growth uh, as well, was, it was predicted to be 2%, was it? But it, it, they've said again that now it's 1.5%. That's got to be really disappointing that we're not expecting as much growth. Yeah, the, the productivity conundrum really is an issue for this country. So um, the, for a long time, the Office for Budget Responsibility has been saying that it expects our productivity, so our, you know, our gross domestic product, to, to rise to around, to, to be growing by about 2%, uh, which is what it was before the recession. It stayed low, uh, stubbornly low, as the Chancellor said in his bu budget speech. And now the, the latest predictions are that it's going to hover much closer to the sort of one and a half, one point three percent level, um, rather than the sort of two, slightly above two percent level, which had been hoped for. Um, now the reasoning for that is there's there's a lot of discussion to be had, which we'll be having discussion of uh, on Chris and Co. Um, is it is it uh, concerns over what's going to be the future after leaving the EU and the uncertainty that that's created? Who knows? Well, Chris, thanks very much. Chris will be back with Chris and Co after the break. But for now, you've been watching Kent tonight live on KMTV. There's more news made just for Kent throughout the evening. But for now, from me, it's goodbye. Have a great evening.